So how's everyone tonight? Happy Wednesday to you. Good to see everybody. And uh, glad to have you here. Glad to see you come in and bring in your teenagers and children if you have teenagers. Appreciate that. They're excited that youth are starting their new curriculum tonight. I'm excited for them. So we're going to do that for about four weeks, and uh, we think this is a curriculum that will work for middle schoolers and our um, also our young adults to be able to combine the leadership and, and do better. So I'm going to meet with them in about four weeks. So we're going to try that out. And we are uh, on our day 33 of our um, sorry day 37 of our. Draw the Circle Prayer Book. A couple of asked what day we were on. Day 37 today. I'm going to look at day 33 tonight, kind of take that call, and uh, run with it here in just a second. But a couple of prayer requests. You know, Barbara Cox's mother is in uh, Forest General. She's in need of prayer tonight. Uh, she has pneumonia, so we're going to pray for her healing. Also, uh, several requests that came out of the way this week, so I want to just uh, ask the Lord to remember those that have come to me, and I know you guys have some prayer requests, so would you just let those be known by raising your hands tonight if you got something that's on your heart. I'll pray over those here in just a second. But let me get these announcements really quickly. Um, we are getting really close to our appreciation day for uh, Pastors Dakota and Rebecca, our assistant pastors that are here. Dakota's going to bring the word that day. That's not this Sunday, but next Sunday. September the 2nd, and so we'd love for you guys to just let them know in your own way, whatever God leads you to do, how much we appreciate them. They've been here a year. Hard to believe this one won't buy that quickly, but they've been here a year, and we want to appreciate them and all that they do. They're a very hard-working couple. So there's nothing I've ever asked them to do that they questioned or got any pushback. They just said, let's do it. And that, that says a lot. It's hard, hard to find someone with that service. Heart. And so I'm thankful for them. I'm thankful for what they're doing for our church. And so I want you guys to thank them as well. Also, um, we are in the bulletin this coming week. We are looking for people to work with our youth uh, in a volunteer capacity, leadership, support team, or assisting at three levels of leadership now. And that's going to be going across the board for our church. But we're going to have a meeting in, uh, next month about that. The date will be in the bulletin this coming Sunday. So if you're interested between now and then, you can uh, see me or Dakota White, and we'll get you involved and you can come to that meeting that day. Our latest night is coming up really quickly. Uh, I had a question again on Sunday. If you've already paid for our original scheduled day for ladies' night, you don't need to repay that, that transfers forward. The only thing we need to know if you did pay and you aren't going to be able to attend that night, um, then we need to know that. This Sunday, uh, not this Sunday, but next Sunday, is really when we need all of that together so we can get everything worked out. That's going to be on Friday night, September the 7th. And also uh, for the live original tour, we want to get those uh, sign-up sheet out there pretty quickly so we can get the seating that, for those that want to go. Our 40-day prayer challenge is going to end uh, this coming Sunday. And so Sunday night, we're going to have a prayer meeting. And it'll be different for those of you who have who have come to prayer meetings before with us. Um, one of the reasons that we had a season where we didn't have prayer meeting is that God was dealing with me about it. It was kind of becoming something that, that He wanted me to take it in a different direction. And so I've been seeking the Lord about that. And through this prayer challenge, I've been asking Him. And He's giving us, given me a lot of ideas in the last few days about how we're going to pray going forward. So right now we'll meet once a month for prayer, corporate prayer. Um, this Sunday night will be our first time. We'll be from 6 to 7.30. Unless God decides differently, we will end at 7.30. I'm going to spend about 30 minutes uh, talking to you kind of about what he's been sharing with me the last 40 days or so. Uh, and then we're going to spend an hour in prayer. And so that is going to be us seeking the face of the Lord, seeking the face of the Lord about some things that I think he wants our church to do going forward for our community and other things. He's also given me some exercises that we'll go through to, to pray for one another, okay? So I want you to come and be a part of that if you can. If you can't, we'll do it again next month. But I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about what we want to do going forward. I don't know about you, but about this time last week when we were on day 40, I'm sorry, day 30, I'm like, man, this is 
this is about to come to an end. I don't want it to end. It's been really, really good. And guess what? It's not going to end. This book's going to end, and you can start it right back over if you want to. But I've got already instructions from the Lord about the next 40 days and how we're going to do that. So next week, next Wednesday night, I'm going to be talking to you about that. Part of that's going to tie into what I'm talking to you here in just a second now. But let's go to the Lord in prayer, okay? Heavenly Father, I love you. I thank you for this group that have gathered here tonight. I thank you for your sweet Holy Spirit. I thank you for your love, Lord. I thank you that you are already in this room, already here ahead of us, already prepping hearts and minds to receive what you've laid on my heart tonight. But Lord, I'm so thankful that somewhere around 100 people have been going through this book together. Lord, I know the unity alone that that brings is going to be powerful. So, Lord, we just want to simply obey you. We want to do what you call us to do, be who you call us to be, and hear your voice clear to God. So, Lord, as I share this tonight, as you've laid on my heart, we look at your word. Just make sure that it's clear, that the instructions are clear. Let me decrease and have you increase in me, God. Let's leave here with a better understanding of how you've made us, Lord, the community that we can create in prayer, and what we can see happen through you, Jesus. Amen. Again, I, I appreciate your efforts to get here on Wednesday night after you've worked, most of you working during the day. I appreciate your time. We're going to wrap up right at 8 tonight, but I'm very encouraged by the amount of people that have been coming. And I'm looking forward to see what God's going to do going forward. As I said, we're going to kind of look at kind of a jump off of day 33 tonight. And for those of you who haven't gotten to 33 or may have forgotten what 33 was about, if we are going to look at prayer partners tonight and what a prayer partner is and, and how God has uh, created us to have people in our circle but also people in our, people in our inner circle that he's called us to have to be prayer partners with. So the scripture for that day was Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side and one on the other. That's Exodus 17, 12. So just to jog your memory, if you haven't read it, not to spoil it for you. I mean, if you have read it, not to spoil it for you if you haven't. Uh, this is about basically getting people to cover you in prayer while you are praying. You have prayer cover. And also this was um, the day that he talked about uh, the man that helped Charles Finney in his revivals. You've heard me talk about Charles Finney before. One of the great evangelists uh, that lived in the late uh, 1700s, early 1800s. And Daniel Nash was his basically his cover for his prayer partner. Daniel would go and travail many weeks before Charles would come in and preach revival. John Wesley had a similar setup for him and also had discipleship set up. So tonight I want us to look at some scripture that you may not have looked at like this before, but I, as I was talking to God today about prayer partners and how God wants us to go forward in our church and how he's looking to basically allow us to grow. Because to grow, we have to have leaders, we have to have intercessors, we have to have all these things happening for us to grow. And so for that to happen, we have to start with prayer. Prayer, pray, prepare, pray. So remember this will come on Sunday morning when we get to praise this coming Sunday. So this 40 days in particular, he was very specific with me that he wanted us to learn to pray and reinvigorate our prayer life, to pray together corporately but separately. Does that make sense? Where we're doing the same thing, but we're also praying in our own time. Because we, if we're not careful, we're relying on someone else to pray for us. We're, we're not taking the time that we need to pray. And so we're relying on grandma, that's the spiritual patriarch of our family, or a pastor, or whoever, to pray. Because we're not really seeking God the way that we should. And one of the things I hope this book has done is encouraged you and realize that there's so much more to prayer than just petition. Remember, petition, and we also receive from God. I hope you've been receiving from Him, and I want to talk to you more about that Sunday night, about what you've been receiving from Him. And also that we put our prayers to action. God tells us to do something that we act on. That. And lastly, that we yield to His Spirit. Pray, we are a Bible. So tonight, I want to kind of look at a passage of Scripture in Ecclesiastes. This passage of Scripture has primarily been used or premarital counseling, or as I've heard it read in weddings, but I really want us to look at that in terms of a prayer circle, an inner prayer circle, or a prayer partner. We'll get into what prayer partners are. So let's look at Ecclesiastes 4. We'll read verses 9 through 12. Two are better than one because they
they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. So I know a lot of you probably heard that read at a wedding and, and talking about the relationship of husband and wife and spouse. And that's where we're going to start. We're going to talk about if you are married, then your spouse should be your closest prayer partner. Now that may not happen for some of you because some of you have accepted Christ and your spouse may not have had that happen to them yet. Or you're, uh, you're not married or you were married but you're not married now. And so I want to kind of run through those scenarios with you. And I don't, this is not to discourage you. If you don't have your significant other yet, don't let the enemy whip you right here. We're going to move on quickly, okay? So don't, desperate people do desperate things and they settle for counterfeits, okay? Don't get me started on that. Too long, too hard, okay? But let's just make sure that you understand that God's got a prayer partner for you. If it is your spouse, that's what he intended it to do. In Genesis chapter 2, it, that person, he or she. In Genesis chapter 2, God said, For a man shall leave his father and mother, and they shall, he shall cling to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Not one soul, not one spirit, but one flesh. Now, what that means is they no longer live for themselves, but they live for each other. Spiritually, that's what we're supposed to do. But also, one flesh means that there's not a person on this earth that would be closer to you than your spouse or should be. And I know your mama's good to you, and I know your grandma's been good to you, but God intends when you come together, or just a mini marriage counseling right now, when you come together, your, your unit, your togetherness, is the most important thing on this earth. Amen. And that prayer that you pray, I believe, is one of the most powerful things on the earth. That's why it's so hard for husbands and wives to sit together or gather hands in the living room with all the family around, and just them two, Pray out loud for each other. It's the most awkward thing you've ever tried to do. You've ever tried to do it until you do it enough to where it's part of your normal practice. So your prayer partner, your closest prayer partner, if they're willing, God doesn't take free will, so how can we, right? If they're willing, should be your spouse. And when I say prayer partner, I mean that you're praying for them and your goal is to pray for them more than they're praying for you. Because a good marriage is all about both people trying to put into it more than they're getting out of it. So a good prayer partner is someone that you know is praying for you like they want to pray for you before they even pray for themselves. So you're looking for these people in your life. If that's not you in your marriage yet and you're not there, then that's okay. God's going to give you someone in your life to be able to pray. Now let's look at an extended part of that in just a second. But... Also, this prayer partner that God is calling you to pray for, if your spouse is not there yet, that's okay. You keep praying for them, all right? You keep praying for them. You keep living out this word in front of them. And I am living proof that that can make a difference. I'm living proof. My life, life did that for 10 years. And look at where I'm standing before you now. Because of her example, because of her prayers, my mother's prayers. So, you want to have your prayer partner to be your wife. Guys, I realize it's awkward to go ahead and hold your wife's hands and lead the home spiritually. I realize that sometimes that's hard to do when she just told you you forgot to take out the garbage and, and y'all just had this conversation of whatever and she knows you better than probably anybody else knows you, but do not let the devil keep you from stepping up to be the spiritual leader of your home, okay? Moms, same way. You're single mother, single dad. That's okay. Step up and be the spiritual leader of your home. Your home should be saturated in prayer daily. There should be, your voice should audibly pray to the Lord and saturate the walls of your house daily. It is a spiritual effect that it has on the home, okay? So we want to make sure that we do that. If you don't have that person in your life, then God is going to give you someone of the same gender. I think it's important that we, that we go ahead and say that. That if you're a guy, God's going to give you a spiritual guy that's a friend of yours, that's your brother. If you're a lady, God's going to give you a spiritual sister that you can pray with. Why, Pastor? What are you talking about? Well, we're talking about building a circle. Okay? We're talking about building a circle of people that we know we can count on to pray. 
that we're also praying for everyone else in that circle. Well, the person that's closest to me next to my spouse needs to be of the same gender that I am because I'm going to share things with them that I would only share with my spouse. And if that's of the opposite sex, there's just too much trouble there to be had. Okay? Everybody clear on that? Yeah, I can't be more crystal clear for you, all right? I'm not saying that I don't have ladies in my life that I can call right now that are my age that I could call and say, I need you to pray or text and say, I need you to pray. But I'm not going to have coffee with them every day of the week or even once a month, just me and her and me pouring out what God's sharing in my life and her pouring out what's sharing in my life. Why? There's just too much room for problems. The perception alone is enough. So I'm saying that pray that God will send you a companion, a prayer partner, a best friend, someone that you can share your life with, someone that can hold you accountable, someone that's dealing with the same things you are as a guy or as a lady, if you're a lady, that you can share with and you are talking once a week about what God's doing in your life. They're talking to you about what God's doing in your life and you're both doing that for each other. Now, this is going to take some time to cultivate but you've got to be looking for that person. And you're not going to know until you try. You're not going to know if this is going to work until you try. Now, we don't go ahead and just dump the laundry truck right there with all the dirt at the first meeting, okay? That could get you hurt. It could get you in trouble. But you are trying to build a relationship. And that relationship should be a time where you're sharing, but that person is also sharing back with you, okay? I've had relationships before where I, I get a call from somebody, but I know this person's really wanting to say, share with me only. I'm talking about other people outside the church. I know they're just wanting to share what's going on with them, and when I get through and we pray, they're ready to get off. They're not really interested in what I have to say. That's not a true prayer of heart. I'm not saying that we don't have seasons in our life where we do need to just download and that person is interceding for us more because they're in a season where it's not. But that's not a true relationship. Now, in terms of friends, let's look at this scripture again, okay? I don't know if you've looked at it this way before or if you just looked at it as a husband and a wife, but let's go back to Ecclesiastes and look at this. Two are better than one because they have good return for their labor. So what we're saying is if we're interceding, if we're going into the throne room of heaven, we know that Matthew 18 and 19 says, where two or three are gathered, there I am also. There's a presence of the Lord that comes. There's power when we agree and pray together. God made us to be in community. He made us to help each other. He made us that way for a reason, so that we're better together than we ever could have been apart. So two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. That is just the same if you look at this and pray tonight. When you're praying and you know someone else is praying for you, that you know that they have your back in prayer, that's important to have. All right, let's look at 10. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. So when you get into a pit spiritually, this prayer partner, your spouse, your closest prayer partner should be willing and able to go into the pit spiritually to pull you out. To get you where God wants you to be. Alright, let's look at 11. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Now that's where most of the people get the marriage problems, okay? But I happen to know, and I'm not going to ask anybody to verify this, but there are some military guys in the house, but I happen to know from some Marines that part of their training is they have to huddle up together to stay warm in combat. That if they're in, a, in an adverse situation and there's no fire, there's nothing, they have to get together to stay warm. Why? Because survival is important. So let's think about that spiritually and take all the sexual part out of that for a second. Think about somebody in your life that you could depend on. That it didn't matter how, what anybody else said about you, what was on the news, what they may even have seen you do. They would come and tell you, I'm not going to leave you out in the cold. I'm not going to have you be this way. I am going to go to bat for you. I'm also going to jerk a spiritual knot in you. Because you're not behaving properly. I have two people in my life who have not given permission to come kick me as hard in the shin as they can if I am not listening because I am not naive enough to think that I can't get off track. 
that I couldn't be deceived because the Bible says that the Antichrist is going to be so convincing at the end of the day that even the elect will be deceived. And the spirit of Antichrist is already moving in the earth. We know that. So I can get off. So I need someone in my life that's looking from the outside to talk to me. Someone that I trust. Now I've had people try to do that before, but I don't know who they are. So how am I going to re receive a word if I don't know their fruit? Matthew 7 says that if I'm going to receive a word from the Lord, I need to know their fruit. So how in the world am I going to know if they're loving, kind, joy, gentle, all those spiritual fruits if I don't have a relationship with them? But if I do, and I see fruit in their life, and I am interceding for them every day, and they're interceding for me, then they may have something for me that they got in prayer. Also, I may have something for them that I got in prayer. It's important to realize that all of us can grow spiritually cold. That's one of the things this book is supposed to do is revive that if you've already been praying. And if not, give you a sense that, man, this, there's a whole lot more to this thing than I've been thinking. And not just getting there and giving our list of needs and getting up, but the powerful presence of the Lord can come into my closet, come into the cab of my pickup. Whatever God wants to do, I can visit Him. So let's go to the next verse. And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. And then we'll get into the court in just a second. Now think about this. If you're in battle and you've got a fight and you're by yourself, nobody's got your back. You don't have eyes in the back of your head. But if there's two of you, you can get back to back and you can fight, physically fight. Think about that in prayer. When you've got somebody in your life that you know you can call, and that person will lift you up. And some of you have grandmothers that you're thinking about right now. Man, I can call Granny, and she can bring down the fire of heaven, burn up anybody that was messing with me tonight. She'll travail all night long. But what I'm saying is that those grannies are getting few and far between. And we want it quick, and we want it easy, and we're not looking to travail ourselves. That's why the pastor's office is always busy, and his prayer list is always full. Pausing to let that marinate for a second. <laughs> Why? Because I know that I'm hoping past the close to God. I don't know. But I need somebody to pray because I'm, I'm not going to pray. I know that I'm not living right, so I just need out of this mess. Well, let's move on. That's, that's, that's strong. <laughs> so, what I'm saying is to be a true prayer partner, let's hang up with one another. And let's do our job, okay? If you've got somebody in that like that in your life, start praying Granny up. She's allowed to have fire coming down from heaven in her house tonight just because you started praying. That's all she needed was that little spark. And all of a sudden, revival will come because we're involved, man. We're not just takers. We're also givers. We're not just receiving, but we're giving. It's a commitment. It's a partnership. It's something that we need. And you need somebody like that in your life. You need somebody. And all of you are thinking right now, well, who could that be? And, and I don't have anybody like that. That's okay. I'm asking you to begin to pray and think about it and ask God to show you possible candidates. And when you see them, just invite them to lunch. Don't say, hey, I'm thinking about tagging you for a prayer party. <laughs> and by the way, here's all my stuff. <laughs> you, know? you don't want to do that. You're just having coffee. Just having lunch. He's identified a couple of guys in my life that I'm going to have coffee for lunch for. But the whole time, I may not be looking like this. I hope I'm not, but I'm doing like this. I'm like, mm, I don't know. We'll see. We will see. But we all have somebody that God has for us like this, guys. Listen to me. Just like if his intent for you is to be married, okay? That person that he intended you to marry has already been created and he created you too for each other. I believe that with all my heart. That's why I'm 26 years in now. Divorce has never been a discussion between my wife and I because we know we were made for each other. God created us for each other. I don't know why he did it, like he did it some days. But he did it. And she certainly don't every day, probably. But we know that. So divorce is never a discussion. Separation is not even a discussion. Why? Because we would be disobedient to God. So you have somebody like that that God, if, he's, if he intends for you to be married, you've got somebody like that that is coming into your life. But I'm saying for you 
that you also have a prayer partner that may be here for a season or maybe here the rest of your life that will fervently pray for you. And if you find somebody that's willing to do that, then you need to invest in them. You need to pray with them and you need to pray for them. And then your extended circle can get bigger because then you can add other people into that circle. But what I want to say the most important thing tonight is this. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. Why was Solomon talking about two all the way down to here? But we all get to this cord of three strands. Well, some of you know, but some of you may not know. Welcome to Facebook. I'm not saying that anybody on Facebook is illiterate, but I'm just saying welcome. A cord of three stands is what he was talking about. The two people and God. The presence, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God wrapping himself around you in prayer. When you join with your brother or your sister and you're praying together, you acknowledge God in the room. Lord, I know you're in this place. Lord, I know you're with me right now. God, I know that you know the needs we've already talked about, but now we need you to intertwine us, Lord. We want you to bind us up because your word also says in Matthew, God, whatever we bind, you're going to bind. But we don't want to bind anything that's not in your will. So we pray your will. We pray your hallelujah, Father, now in this place. Now, you don't want to have lunch with your prayer partner and go right there right then. You may not. Have a prayer partner for very long. But that's where you want to get to. You want somebody to get a hold of God, and you want to be a hold of them. So that when they text you or call you, it doesn't matter what hour of the night, you'll get up and intercede. God has us. When we begin to start doing that corporately as a church, woo, how does we're going to look out? Come on. We're going to turn this place on the spiritual ear. The hierarchy that's been put over the spiritual realms will be transformed. And we will see revival come. Amen. But it will be done on our knees. It's not going to be some special service. It's not going to be some dynamic preacher that comes in. It's going to be just like it was on the day of Pentecost. It's going to be a prayer meeting. It's, if you look at any revival that has ever started, any revival that's ever started. Brownsville, for the most recent that I can think of, the one in West Virginia that was just a couple years ago with all those teenage students, they all started, research it for yourself, they all started with a prayer meeting. Okay? God's been wearing me out with this. He said, you're trying to create the best song, the right service, you're trying to create the right atmosphere, trying to get the right effect while you're preaching, but you just need to have the right prayer meeting. You just need to get on your face and humble yourselves and watch what I will do. So what I'm saying is find you somebody in your life. Ask the Lord to lead you to that person for you. And you two begin to pray. You begin to share your needs with each other as you begin to build the trust that God has. And you guys begin to pray. And then the church will be made up of all these mini circles. And when we get together, there's this huge big prayer circle. And the day of Pentecost will come yet again. Because it's happened over and over and over. But it's only happened. Only happened when people have humbled themselves. Whose kingdom are we really building? Who are we looking for notoriety? Who, who do we want to be elevated? When we humble ourselves and pray, God's going to do amazing things. So I want you to begin to think about that. If your spouse, and you're here tonight, or you're going home to talk to your spouse, ask them, can I just pray with you? Even if they won't pray back, just say, is it okay if I pray today? Can we pray out loud together? Why do you want to pray out loud, Pastor? Well, it's important to pray out loud. When Teresa and I are going through tough times, either externally or internally. We're going through a tough patch and we're both going through things and we don't want to be stressed out with each other and we don't want to say hurtful things to each other. We get together and we pray out loud. Why? Because I hear her heart when she's praying and I might not have thought about it that way. I might not even know what she's going to deal with that day because most of the days we go separate ways and she hears mine and there's unity because God is in the room. That other strand just wraps it around it and firms up the marriage and it'll do the same thing for these friendships I'm talking about that we need to create. God is able to help us get to that point. And I know it's awkward, guys, if you haven't done it before. It's even awkward for me now sometimes because I know I have my own struggles, but God wants you to assume the spiritual headship of your house. 
Whoever's the head of the house, you need to assume it. If it's just you in the house, assume it and run everything else out spiritually in Jesus' name. It's important that we get a hold of that and understand and know that God's called us to do this. And, and I've had people say, why, why do you go around the room sometimes when it's just a few of us and you ask everybody to pray? And again, if public prayer is not your thing, I, I'm not trying to embarrass you. I know some of you are introverts. But, but there's times when we all pray and God can hear all our prayers at one time and everybody's going. But there's times that I want to hear the prayers of the room. There's times that I want to hear somebody pray for the lost students that are in Hattiesburg High School tonight. There's sometimes, sometimes I just want to hear somebody stand up. All of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord has moved on them in a prayer meeting and said, I feel that burden. I'll pray for those students. I feel it right now in my heart. I just want you to pray through me, Holy Spirit, and pray the prayer that God hears. Amen? There's times that it does that. And I know that's awkward. If that's not your skill set, I'm not going to force you to do that. I don't want to freak anybody out from coming to prayer meeting, okay? That's not going to happen. I'm not going to say you pray right now or you pray right now. I am saying that when it's just you by yourself and your spouse, just pray. Just pray. Let them hear your heart. Let them hear you talking to God. Let your children hear you pray. It's important that our children hear us pray. I've had honor ask me many times what I was doing. Sometimes I'm happy. Sometimes I'm mad. Sometimes I'm loud. Sometimes I'm quiet. Sometimes I'm weeping. And I just tell them I'm talking to God. He said, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. It's important that they hear us pray. So we're talking about a partnership here, as I've said already. So our goal is also to have someone that has more experience and maturity than we do in our circle. All right? You should always have someone that you feel is a little further along than you are. And you should also have someone eventually in your circle that you feel like you're helping that you're mentoring. This person, you've got them, you're, you're helping them, kind of bringing them into that circle. There's a circle of trust there. We need these people in our lives. I, I want, I'm going to be purposeful to spend time with some older people who I know who have prayed for decades. I want, I want to hear and understand and know how they pray. I've heard them pray before. You've heard them pray before, some of you. You know the power in their prayers. And so we want to make sure that we're a part of that. We've got somebody in our life that's kind of moving us forward. Also, in your prayer circle, I'm going to be in your prayer circle. When you text me and tell me to pray, I'm there. But I'm telling you, God has somebody for you, not including me. He's got somebody that you could get a hold of. Because if all of you called me at the same time, you couldn't get a hold of me. So he's got somebody in your life that is praying for you fervently every day. And he's got somebody that he wants you to do the same for. All right, so now, what do you do when you pray? How do you pray in these prayer circles? What, what goes on in there? Well, I've talked about your needs and their needs. Now let's look at 1 Timothy 2, uh, 1 and 2. Timothy says, first of all, then I urge that entreaties, meaning petitions and prayers, well, petitions, there you go, and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. For kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Let's read that again. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. So we're praying for the harvest. For kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. So when we get together and pray, we've got to pray for the harvest. If I have Jesus living inside of me, there is a spirit that dwells in me that wants to leave the 99 and go after the one. That's who he is. And so the more I surrender to that spirit, the more I am aware of those that need to know Jesus. And the more that I surrender to that, the more I am called and ready and desiring to pray for those that don't know him yet. And so your prayer partner, as I said, when you get together and you pray that powerful prayer, make sure you're praying for the harvest. Not just revival, because I think most of us, when we think revival, we think some spiritual, really huge event where all the gifts are manifested and, and we're all having to throw down and uh, stuff comes out of the ceiling and all this stuff, and it's all about what we get and not what we give. True revival. Mm -hmm. 
True revival will be what happened on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 people will come to know the Lord. And they will go and they will eat in each other's houses. And they will commune with one another. And one of them has need. Some will go sell something and give it to that one. That's really what revival is about. That's what's going to turn this nation back to God. It's what's going to bring us back to having Him the head of this place. And we need to pray for our leaders to have that kind of experience with the Lord. I remember prior to this administration, the eight years prior, when Barack Obama was president, that's when the Lord dealt with me because he made some decisions that I felt was contrary to the Word of God. I was very grieved about it, very upset, and I was praying. And he said, you need to start praying for that man right now. Amen. That man is one encounter away from me from being the greatest asset that's ever been seen. No, you don't have to look any further than Saul of Tarsus to see who you believe is your greatest enemy could be your greatest asset. So from that day forward, I've been praying for whoever is the president. That God would raise up leaders and he would bring them back down. Whatever he wanted was what I wanted, but I am called to pray. I'm called to pray for whatever administration. I'm called to pray that they make godly decisions. And I've got to pray for my governor. I've got to pray for the mayor. That's what we do when we come together. We begin to get outside of our inner needs and inner circle. And we begin to pray that God be manifested in the region and areas that we live. Amen? So it's important. Why is it important? Let's look at 3 and 4 of that same passage of Scripture here. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. Wow. Who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. The most political gain you can gain, the most political influence you could ever have is on your knees. Why? Because we live in dignity. We don't get all sideways. We don't go and protest. That's not who we are. We're the people of God. God's on the throne no matter who's in the White House. And we walk and we behave every day as though we know that. As though we know who's in charge. So that we're not getting all upset. That we're not getting sideways. That we're not alienating a group of people by our Facebook post. That we might could love and reach for the kingdom of heaven. That we might could understand them a little bit more. Because hurting people hurt people. People who don't know God act like they don't know God. We're all shocked by that somehow. Just appalled. Well, am I bringing it? I'm really, I'm really saying it. Right? Okay. I'm just, it's out there. Let's deal with it. All right? You are going to win people. And you are going to change this world by love. Love never fails. Love doesn't know color of skin. It doesn't know political party. It doesn't know donkey, elephant, jackrabbit, nothing. It knows lost or saved. Knows my love, never heard of my love. Been abused when they were young. Been pampered since the day they were born. Both of them need me to do what I've called them to do. That's what we've got to share with people. I was a sinner just like you. I was broken and I was hurt just like you. And I don't know what you're going through and I don't know why you're behaving like that. But here's old Joe. Joe acted just like you about three months ago. But the power of God did it. Mm. Joe was Joe wants to visit with you. Joe wants to pray with you. Can he pray with you? I've been in neighborhoods that people told me not to go into and walked every afternoon. I've been, I have people that live in the neighborhoods that said, please don't go back there. Please don't go back there. You're not going to come back out. And I'm not saying go do that tonight, but if you prayed up, that was foolish, okay? Well, say, Pastor told you to go do that. But I wanted to know that I was serving a God that was on the throne. And I'd walk through those places. I'd see people doing all kinds of despicable things. And I'd walk by and I, and I look very different than they did. And they'd look at me like, what are you doing in here? I said, I'm walking down the street praying. And I'm looking for somebody to pray for. Can I pray for you? 90% of the time they would say, yes. 90% yep. yep. of the time they would say, yes. I'd walk right in the middle of it. Right in the middle of it. And say, oh God. Oh God! Would you come and bless these people with your presence? I want them to know that you're here, God. Not because I'm here, but because you already were here. Before I ever got here, you knew this meeting would happen. 
When you knew me in my mother's womb, you knew this thing would happen. You know that I am a sinner, was a sinner, just like these men. And they're doing it now. But God, you can love them to repentance. We'd say amen and I won't. We've got to realize that prayer changes things. Not all these other things that we're getting so caught up and so busy about. It's important that we live dignified lives. There's no reason to become undignified. No reason. Because we know who's on the throne and we know who's going to come get us and we know who our daddy is. My daddy's created the cattle on a thousand years. He spoke this world into existence. So really, what will happen? Amen. All right. So lastly, I want to look at this scripture. This is my request to you. Romans 15, 30. This is Paul's request to the church of Rome. Dear brothers and sisters, I urge you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to join in my struggle by praying to God for me. Do this because of your love for me given to you by the Holy Spirit. Every pastor, every leader, every mom, every daddy needs this to happen in their life. Dear brothers and sisters, I urge you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to join in my struggle, Paul says, by praying to God for me. Do this because of your love for me, given to you by the Holy Spirit. Amen. So it's important that we pray for one another. Before we're going to disagree with one another, have we prayed about it? Before we're going to do anything, have we prayed about it? Have we sought the face of God? Do we know God's will in this situation? And if not, we must continue to push and press for God's will. Amen? Amen? I remember when my last person that's old, over the Church of God's in, in Mississippi got here, Pastor Chris Moody. And I remember two bishops prior to him, God started telling me not to call them administrative bishops or or leaders, we get, get so caught up in titles, and just start calling them pastor. Because they pastor all the churches, and I'm the pastor of the church, so they pastor pastors. So I started calling them pastor. And the one that was here recently, he just moved to, to Tennessee this week. As soon as he got here, God said, you call him, you ask him the name of his children. You ask him the name of his wife, and you begin to intercede for them every time you go before him. And I've done my best to do that. It's important that we pray for those that are laboring for us, who have spiritual oversight of us. It's, they need our prayers. They, they need it. I need it. We need it to move forward to how God made us. Amen? Amen? So, back to testimonies, kind of, with, in the story of us getting here and kind of where we were. Last time I talked to you about kind of where we were with the house and the, and the house was on the market for three years all those things that happened in the provision and the things that God did when we prayed. Eventually, after three years, the house sold. And it really was a bittersweet time because after you pray for something to happen so long, you're just kind of messed up when it actually happens. You're just like, is this really happening? You know, and Teresa's getting real emotional at the signing. And the people across the table are like, oh, y'all don't want to sell? And I'm like, she's fine. She's fine. And three years, you know. I said, we're just, we're just thankful that God answers prayer. We're just thankful that God has seen us through this time in our lives. So let's talk a little bit tonight about the history of this church and kind of, kind of what God has done, not all the way, because we won't get that far. we only got about 10 minutes left, but I'll, I'll do some more next week. But as I said, when we moved here, I, I knew that I didn't have any work, and I knew that I didn't know anybody, and I knew that I had to find work to, to be... Uh, actually eat, obviously, and take care of my family, and also we needed a place to meet because the house thing wouldn't work out. I told you that last time. We couldn't afford furniture because we had furniture in another place. I thought it was a good idea to get lawn chairs and blow up beds, and I thought we were Jim Jones, the cold, and so it didn't go good. So I had to try to find a place, and so I found this place on Old Eleven, Old Legacy. Beautiful white building at the end. If you've never, never been out there, go look at it. It's a beautiful building, but if you go by there, even tonight, ride through there, unless they've changed it drastically, it looks pretty spooky. It looks like children of the corn down there on the bottom. And so we still struggle with getting people into that space. But God sent someone in that neighborhood to come to every Bible study that we had, just about it, 
It was a young, it was a, a lady, a middle-aged lady, her grandmother, and her two children. And so faithfully, every week, Teresa and I would, I would take the grandmother and the lady, and I would teach them the Bible, and Teresa would take the two children upstairs in that building. And we were just faithful with what God sent us. We just kept praying, we kept believing, we kept believing that God was going to give us a different place, and we were faithful with them, and we were faithful with them up until they moved. They never attended a service in our building with us, but we were having Bible study with them. And in the meantime, I was going, and I was, uh, my, my pastor that I've been talking about, the person that's over all the Church of God in Mississippi, heard my heart and heard my vision, he said, we're going to have services, we're going to have opportunities, and we're going to go all over the state, and I'm going to let you cast your vision. And so I would go, and we would, he would preach, and I would just get up and take about 10 minutes and tell him what I believe God had called me to do. Well, praise God, prayer works, and sharing the vision works, because guess what? The vision follows vision, not the other way around. Okay? So in that first year, from lay people, not from churches, not from sponsorship or anything, and from lay people, we raised enough money to, to pay rent on a building if I could find a building. And so we raised enough money to, that I thought was going to have a good building. I thought we could get more than what we could get out of it. But to come to find out, I didn't know what real estate cost in this side of town. I had no clue what real estate went for it in this side of town. And so I saw this building, two buildings down here that we met in. It's the only building I ever looked at. I rode by it several times and I thought, this might be it. I walked into that building, Teresa will tell you, the presence of the Lord hit us just like it hit us down here at that gas station when he said, this is the place, this is the place you need to be. And it hit us and I knew it was it. And so I told him, I said, man, that sounds good. I said, what y'all what y'all getting for rent? And this was, you know, I I felt like I'd got enough money to get that pledge was coming in, and they told me about double what I thought I could afford. And I said, well, I'll have to rethink that. I can't do that. So would you consider this? And I'm not saying it because he's a, he considers himself to be a pretty sharp businessman. I don't want to hear his stuff. But he was good to me. And I said, he said, absolutely not. That's ridiculous. And I said, I'm not trying to offend you. And I agree, that is ridiculous. Because I have called around now, and I realize that. But I'm just telling you that God said this is the place, and I believe this is where we need to be. Well, about six months go by, I ride by it, ray it all over. You know. That's yours, Lord. That's where you want us. I never looked at anywhere else. Just kept being faithful with my view that I had in the building, and right before Christmas, the week of Christmas, they give me a call and say, hey, do you want to come back in here and we want to talk about it? Chris and I go to eat lunch, we eat at Dukes, thinking that, hey, this is bang or bust, we might as well splurge for lunch. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going in there thinking he's going to meet me about halfway. Like I said, we're done. And I know I can't do that. I, I know I can do that. And about the time I go, my, my pastor calls me and says, what do you think we can get that building for? And I said, well, I know what we can't get it for. Well, we can't get it. And he said, wouldn't it be God to get it for a little less than that? And I said, it sure would be. He said, what are you thinking? And I told him, no. He said, that's what I was thinking too. Now, whether he was or not, I was probably just standing in the fire. You know? But I go in there, and they, they talk to me, and they say, we want to know what you want to do. And I said, well, this is actually what I want to do. I know what I said before. And I'm not here trying to play tricks and games with y'all. But this is what I need to do. This is what I think I can do. And I can guarantee you. And I can write you a check for the whole year right now. That's what I need to do. They drop their heads. And I'm like, here we go. And they both look up. And they say, we're going to do that. And you don't have to do it. You might need something between now and then. Hopefully, you're going to have some people come. He said, now, i got a bad opinion in churches. They don't pay their rent. I said, mine will be on time. I'll pay you left before I pay them home. I assure you, I won't disgrace the Lord, I said. And he said, well, I like to think you work for the same guy. I said, I'd like to think that too. <laughs> and he said, well, we're going to do it. Here's the lease. Let's sign. Man, I got in the car. Woo! Man, I jumped in the truck. I'm telling Teresa, we got it, baby. We got it. This is how the Lord keeps you home. She looks at me and goes, oh, no, no, no. And I'm like, what? She's pointing to my face. 
place and I looked, and well, I had to eat capers. You know what capers are? They're like little olives. Oh, this the whole hole was on my front tooth. Oh, I'm tired of my pocket in there like this. And I'm like, Wah! And I'm like, this had to be God. This is only God that gives it. It keeps us humble, though. So we get it January the 1st. We work on it for three weeks, trying to clean it up. It's a dance game. You know, it's got mirrors on one wall. This wall's blue, this wall's green, and that wall's yellow. <laughs> it's got wide open. You can see the parking lot from the front. There's mirrors on this side. You know, I'm not getting this church thing figured out about what they're supposed to look like. And so I said, well, the first thing we're going to do is pray over this building. We've got to have a prayer. So I, I, I just put out... So the few little people that have been coming, I think I most I ever had was eight. Man, I fired up that night. I told the eight that I had, I said, tell the folks we have a prayer meeting, we're fixing to start vision casting services on Sunday. This was the week of the 24th of January. I came in that night, it was a Thursday night, 35 people showed up. We joined hands in a circle. There's still pictures if you go to our Facebook page, you can find them. We joined hands in a circle. And I say, Lord, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to be, this is what I want. This is your church. This is your place. These are your people. And so, very quickly, and I'll close. So that Sunday, I go, well, that's, that's a Thursday, and the Sunday prior, I had gone to a church that we visited. We would visit churches when before we started going here, and Teresa would visit a lot when I worked because I was evangelizing at the same time. But we went to a church, and this is a great church, so I'm not disparaging this church, and I will not reveal who it, who it was. But we were there. She took Hunter to Children's Church. I was in the foyer, and the Lord said, I need you to stay in this foyer until I tell you to go inside. Oh, boy, boy, here we go. So I'm standing in the foyer, and the greeter comes back to me and says, can I help you? I said, I'm good. I'm, I'm going to go in in just a second. He said, well, are you waiting on somebody? I said, I'm waiting on somebody. <laughs> and so, you know, the little security guy, he's getting all excited. And I'm sitting there, and church gets started. And I'm like, oh, what's going on? Here? And finally, he's going inside. And I talk to him. He said, going inside. And he says, how many people spoke to you since you did it? How many people spoke to you in that floor? I said, well, him and the security guy. He said, yeah, that's their job. Who wins? I said, no. He said, I'm sending them all over the city every week. Nobody's ready. Nobody wants to receive them. Nobody's ready to love them. What are you going to do? And I told them. I told that little group that night what I thought. And I remember sitting that Sunday morning. 43 people showed up that Sunday morning. I remember sitting right here on this corner with my head between my knees going, what in the world is about to happen? Lord, I don't know. I don't know how to do what you're asking me to do. I don't know how to get across to this group of people to love. I can't force them to be friendly. I can't force them to be open. I can't force them to love. He said, just get up and be, let me flow through you. And so I'm preaching that Sunday morning vision. Casting it with all my heart out of Second Timothy, by the way. About the divine faith that first dwelt in Timothy's grandmother, and that Paul knew dwelt in his mother, and that Paul was convinced dwelt in him too. And to fan the flame, the gift. I spent nine weeks on one passage of scripture. I had to pin up a while. I had to, had to preach it. Let's get it out. And so after that first service, I'm closing, thinking, I'm casting vision of what God wants us to do. He says to me, he says, there's people here that don't know me, and there's people here who are, are running from me, call them home. So I'm closing, and I stop, and I tell him what he said. And that Sunday, four people gave their hearts to Jesus Christ. The next Sunday, three. The next Sunday, two. And so on and so on. Up until just a few weeks ago, almost every Sunday, we see someone. Make a decision for us. We saw people this past Sunday. But I'm telling you, what used to be a flow has turned to a trip. And I'm concerned about it, so I'll begin to pray. And the shift is church. What I thought we would do when we first.
Jesus got here is what we've got to do now. And that's go out. We've got to go out and show people what's happening inside these doors. But more importantly, we've got to go out and show them what's happening inside of hearts. Because if you can get a renewed spirit, and we can be the hands and feet of Jesus, love the unlovable, do things for people that would never do anything for us, we're going to see people radically change because love never fails. Amen? Amen. Amen. I love you. I'm looking forward to preaching to you, at you with you <laughs> Sunday about praise. It's an interesting passage of scripture he's given me on praise for this Sunday. So I look forward to seeing you. I look forward to our prayer meeting Sunday night. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his countenance rest upon you. May you go from this place tonight. Bless the Lord. And let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that our hearts be stirred by you. I pray, Lord, that you would invigorate us, that, that there would be a warmness come to us, a spiritual fire. John Wesley said his heart grew strangely warm as he was sitting in that crowd that night. Lord, I, I pray that you would raise up intercessors, that you would raise up prayer circles and partners, not just in this fellowship, but all over the city, Lord. Invigorate every pulpit that preaches your word from cover to cover. Let your spirit flow into those pulpits and those churches, Lord. We need, we need everyone that's willing, Lord, to reap the harvest, but I believe it's coming. But also, Lord, show us the way. Show us the way into this city. Show us the way into these neighborhoods. Show us the way to those people who seemingly have everything, but we know that they're lost. And when they lay down at night, they know they have nothing. God, help us find them. Help us show us where they are. Show us what to do to help them. And most of all, may we be a representation of you. May we be your hands and feet. May we see the harvest come. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Y'all have a good rest of the week.